Hello and welcome back to Facts Lab. It's so good to see you that I brought a little present for you today. We're going to learn how to survive not one, but two nuclear bombs. And why two, you say? Because here at Facts Lab, we believe in the double tap rule. Time has taught us that the best way to learn is from experience. So we're going to talk about Stoyo Yamaguchi, who back in 1945 survived nuke after nuke in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So you're going to give me superpowers, God? Why, yes I am. And they will be magnificent. In fact, you'll be able to survive a nuclear blast. You know what? Make it two. Oh man, that's going to be awesome. Wait a minute. Does that mean I'm going to get hit by a nuke? Uh, don't worry about it. You'll be fine. Now the first nuke out of the two that he experienced was the little man that was dropped on Hiroshima. Now this bomb was actually wildly inefficient. Lucky for him, it was only coming in at about 1.5% efficiency. But with nukes, it doesn't really matter. When this thing exploded, it created a 400 meter wide fireball that was right around the temperature of the sun at 6,000 degrees Celsius. And then immediately would flatten about five square miles of land. And all that from a measly 14.5 kiloton explosion. Now that would mean it's equal to about 14.5 thousand tons of TNT going off at the same time, or just about one trip to the bathroom after Taco Bell. Now this all happened on August 6, 1945, when Yamaguchi was on a business trip. He saw the bombing plane go by, and he said that after the explosion went off, he thought the sun fell out of the sky. Now he didn't have enough time to do anything but run and get cover in a ditch, and he amazingly survived only three kilometers away from the bomb. Definitely not unscathed, of course. He received third-degree burns almost throughout his entire body. He was temporarily blind and received burst eardrums as well. Now, even though the death toll that day was 129,000, a lot of people actually survived the initial blast of the little man. So much so that Yamaguchi went looking for his business partners, and they were trying to find a way home. Now, the bridges were out, so they had to wade through a river full of bodies of men and women who had passed away from the blast just to get to the train station so they could head back home to try and catch a few days of rest before going back to work. Now it's August 9th, around 11 a.m. Yamaguchi is standing in the office explaining to his boss how the sun fell out of the sky in Hiroshima. And he's like, yeah, it was crazy. It was so bright. It was just like, it was just like that over there. And the second bomb went off and he was only three kilometers from this one again. Now, luckily they were having a nice little stairway chat. So that took the brunt of the explosion and really limited the blast getting to Yamaguchi and his boss. And he was able to survive again. What the man. Now, the fat man that landed on Nagasaki actually provided a 23 kiloton blast. Like I said before, that's 23,000 pounds of TNT going off at the same time with an efficiency of right around 17%. So this bomb was way more efficient. Now, even though that bomb yielded a way larger explosion, the death toll was way less. The numbers go all the way up to around 80,000 there or so. And actually, 160 people were rumored to have survived both bombs in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. 71% of the population survived in Hiroshima, and even more in Nagasaki, coming in at around 76%. Now, bombs were getting better every day during the nuclear race. For example, in 1961, the USSR set off the Tsar Bomba, and it had an explosive load of around 50 megatons. That's 50 million tons of TNT. Approximately the same as about 3,000 Hiroshimas, or equal to a total of 10 times the amount of all the ammunition spent in World War II. Now, rumor has it, Russia was working on a nuclear torpedo back in 2015 that had a payload that would be over double the Tsar Bomba, right around 100 megatons. Now, surviving anything like this would come down to two things. How close you are to the bomb when it went off, and what you do immediately after. Now, there's definitely a lot of scenarios we can go through, but the one we're going to use is where the bombs detonated about 8.5 miles above ground, maximizing the distance and the damage. Now, after less than a second... The shockwave would destroy any residential house up to about a 20 mile radius. Right around 35 miles out, any exposed wood immediately sets ablaze. Now if you're outside at 45 miles, third degree burns everywhere. At 62 miles, all the windows and cars and homes completely blown out. Now they say if you even see the blast, it will cause temporary blindness, if not make you go completely blind, as well as blow out your eardrums up to 60 miles out. On to the surviving part. If you're anywhere outside about 40 miles, you could be outside and still survive, technically. If you consider being blind, deaf, and burnt everywhere, alive. Now most of this damage would come from the near immediate thermal blast that would come from the light off the bomb. The pressure wave would follow soon after. 
moving in even closer, you would be able to survive at 35 miles inside a house behind at least one wall, even though debris from the bomb would make it more of an issue on survival. Moving even closer to the blast, right around 15 miles out, if you were under 6 feet of dirt in a concrete reinforced bunker, you might just make it. But why are you here if you have all that stuff? You know what you're doing. And to be honest, if you were underground in a concrete bunker, you could probably be even a little closer. But here at Vaxlap, we don't take chances. We want to stay alive. So the bomb has dropped and you are where you are. The next biggest thing to worry about is going to be radiation. Now, radiation in such heavy amounts like that does extreme damage to the human body. For example, it rips through your DNA so that your body can no longer make cells correctly and you're effectively walking dead. Now, if you're inside that 20 mile radius, you don't have to worry long because you already passed. Going all the way out to 60 miles is going to be heavily radiated. Outside of that, you might have a chance. If you're not hit with the radiation from the blast, you have just about 15 minutes to get cover before the radioactive fallout starts coming down, and unless you have the fastest car around, you better find some shelter. Once that radioactivity goes up into the atmosphere, it's going to travel for hundreds of miles around on high-speed winds, affecting all surrounding states. Now your survival comes down to three things, time, distance, and protection. Now the radioactivity left around by bombs caused by fission doesn't last as long as you think. For example, the radiation in the bomb would only be half as strong about two hours after the explosion. Even so, it's recommended that you wait at least a full seven days before leaving your shelter. Now, the best place to find protection would be in the basement of a home with not too many entrances or windows. And obviously, you would have to seal these off as best as you could, duct tape for the windows, and multiple sheets for the entrances. Now, if your house doesn't happen to have a basement, the second best option is to go to the innermost room of the house and seal all windows, entrances, and vents. So this means no AC or cooling. And the last best option would be a car. That's because the heaviest radioactive chemicals that you need to keep off your body are going to be about the size of sand or salt. And then soon after that, the radioactive dust is going to come in. And that's where it comes down to sealing windows, vents, and doors. Now once you've found that shelter, it's time to get naked and bathe. And that's because you could have radioactive particles on you still, and you need to take that clothing and double bag it and get it as far away from you as possible without exposing yourself to more radioactivity. Now hopefully you have new clothes, and enough food and water for seven days. And if you don't, apparently it is okay in extremely short amounts to go out after three or four days. So hopefully you got enough to last you till then. Now, if you have to travel out in these three or four days, even the seven days after, you must be wearing a mask. And not like these ones we wore for COVID, you want a tightest seal to your face as possible. So if you don't have a better mask on hand, using a wet shirt would be the last option. And after any trip outside, you need to wash yourself and hopefully get a new pair of clothes. If not, wash your clothes and dispose of that water as safely as possible. Now you've survived the seven days in the shelter. Hell, you even waited 10 just to make sure. Now you gotta figure out if help is coming or if this was a full scale attack and you're on your own. Now if it's only a small scale attack, you're gonna wanna stay and build up your shelter as best as possible, as well as making it known to the outside world that you need help and that this place is occupied by survivors. And the best way to do that is with big signs for SOS or help. They need to be visible from the sky as well. Now, no matter if it was a small scale or a large scale attack, you're going to need supplies. So getting anything from the outside world needs to be completely sealed in plastic or canned goods are the best. And when transporting those supplies, you're going to want to put them in a bag to make sure that you're not getting any more radiation on them. As well as when you get back, clean everything and dispose of all the waste products properly. A strong word of advice, don't get any post-nuclear bomb canned products. I know they look appealing because they're glowing, but they're unsafe. If it's only a small-scale attack, you should be good writing it out on your supplies until the military or the National Guard show up to rescue you. Now, if it's a large-scale attack, we're going to assume that your luck is as bad as Yamaguchi's and that you're going to get nuked here again soon. Now, if you were anywhere near the original blast zone, you're going to want to get as far atmospherically upwind as possible. This will prevent more chances of radiation poisoning. And I would say if you're searching for a new shelter, a minimum of 75 miles upwind from the blast zone would be a necessity. Now hopefully your new shelter has running water because you're going to want to fill up any bathtubs and sinks with water or any extra containers you have as well. And this is because the water in the pipes will be contained and radioactive free for a long time until the reservoirs that feed them become radioactive themselves. And in preparation for the next nuclear attack, you're going to want to keep supplies on hand for at least a month per person for food and water. And last but not least is protection. You're going to want to build up your bunker with any surrounding supplies that aren't radioactive already. Now make sure you clean and wash everything before bringing it into your new habitat. Welcome to your brand new temporary lifestyle. 
Now you're outside one day feeding the eight-legged chickens and you see a flash in the distance. This is your sign to get the hell inside and leave the chickens. They survived once, they can do it again. Now using some quick math based on absolutely nothing, did you know that the human eye can see a single candle in complete darkness up to 14 miles away? And let's say this nuclear bomb you saw is like 3 billion luminous, right? We're going to say it's more than 100 miles out. So you have approximately 30 seconds or more if the pressure wave even reaches you. Now you're probably pretty safe as long as you're atmospherically upwind from the blast. Now you've effectively survived two nuclear bombs. And even if that second one was closer, you would have been ready anyways because you've been reinforcing your shelter this entire time, correct? After you've sheltered long enough and you're sure there's no more nuclear threat, you're going to want to move to lands that haven't been radiated yet. Now, good luck, and don't forget your eight-legged chickens. Now, thanks again for joining us on that near-apocalyptic end to the world. And here at FactSlap, we care about your safety. Because even after a nuclear attack, we still want your views. Don't forget, keep your fact hands strong.